Moving on from different types of cultural psychology, it's really important to understand how in cross-cultural psychology, we may be able to compare across cultures. And that's why this mini lecture is gonna discuss cultural dimensions. The understanding of cultural dimensions is all about if we, if we want to compare across cultures to see what, um, how to classify cultural patterns, we need to be able to measure differences and similarities. And to do that, we need some indices that we can compare across cultural groups. What cultural dimensions do, and there are a huge variety of them, by the way, we're only going to be talking about a few of them in the, in the mini lecture today. Um, they assess variations between nations as a proxy for culture. So as I said in the previous mini lecture, cross-cultural psychology uh, looks at uh, understanding culture as a thing that we can measure that's somehow outside of the individual. And one of the ways to do that is to treat nations or um, uh, groups of people even within a nation as distinctive units. And then what you do and you measure how individuals within that group um, think and feel or behave in a particular way. And then we average across people within that nation to say that these are national or cultural ways of doing things. So when we talk about cultural dimensions, we refer to the general tendencies that affect behavior and reflect cultural variability at the national level. That's what cultural dimensions are, even though, as we'll be learning a little bit later on, sometimes we do we try to apply them to individuals and they, that may not work as well. So cultural dimensions tell us something about how people within a particular social group, and that tends to be within a particular nation, behave or think and feel. There are many ways of defining cultural dimensions and the ones that we're going to be talking about predominantly today are the most common ones that are used within cross-cultural psychology and they are the dimensions of Hofstede and the dimensions of Schwartz. Hofstede's dimensions are the ones that you would have most likely heard about either previously in your studies or outside in your everyday life. And that's because they're the most well-known and um, most widely used cultural dimensions, both in the literature and outside in practice. Hofstede um, was a researcher that was working for IBM and uh, his research around cultural dimensions started when he undertook an organizational survey across a large number of sites for IBM um, that represented many different uh, samples from a variety of different cultures or national groups. And in analysing that data, what Hofstede found out was that there was uh, there seemed to be patterns of responses or averages and responses that were quite distinct in some national groups or countries than there were in others. And from that, he um, identified four major cultural dimensions, which are the first four dimensions on these on this list. The final two dimensions that um, we'll talk about at the very end came later once um, the, the research was broadly employed across a variety of other contexts and countries. But in terms of power distance, the way that we can understand this dimension is at the high level of power distance, there are, um, there are hierarchies between people and there's a lot of formalized structures that are based on status and role. Whereas um, in countries where there's low levels of power distance or tendencies towards low levels of power distance, um, people tend to try to equalize power and distribute it evenly um, across people within society rather than just focusing on status and on role. Something um, as an example, you um, in, in an academic environment, if we were in a high power distance uh, context, you would be more likely to call me Dr. Stewart then you would be to call me by my name, Jamie, um, because by calling me by my name, that it, what that is doing is reducing some of the power structures that have to do with my, um, my status and my role as an academic. Whereas in a high power distance culture, we, we use titles like doctor in, in order to main, maintain that hierarchy and respect between um, individuals of lower and higher power and status in society. The second cultural dimension is individualism and collectivism. And this is probably one that you have heard of before, um, specifically because we use these terms often to talk about people, but um, Hofstede and these dimensions talk about them in terms of culture. So individualistic cultures tend to be those ones with your preference for loosely knit social frameworks, 
And what that means is there's a preference for uh, achievement orientation of the individual as independent and autonomous from the collective, whereas in collectivism, there's a preference for tightliness net framework in society, which means that you're responsible and obligated not just to the self, but to the collective. And the collective could be at the broadest level, the nation state, or it could be a community or even a family. The third dimension, um, which forgive me, and I did not name this dimension, and you must forgive hopefully Hofstetter as well, for the time at which, um, or the, the year in which this was developed. Uh, this is called masculinity femininity. And the, the dimension is not based on the idea of more males or more females in a society. It actually has nothing to do with gender. It is, um, it's based around the idea of uh, achievement orientation and assertiveness and material rewards for success, which are characteristics of um, what is what is desired in a more masculine oriented society as compared to um, a more feminine oriented society, which literally stands for a greater level of cooperation, modesty and caring, a focus on quality of life rather than achievement. The fourth dimension is uncertainty avoidance. Uh, uncertainty avoidance describes the distinction between maintaining a high uh, rigid codes of belief and practices that are intolerant of unorthodox behaviours and ideas. And what that means is that there is a really strong, rigid structure in society where social norms and protocols must be followed, versus in societies of low levels of uncertainty avoidance, um, there's a more relaxed attitude to the way that people, that it's thought that people should behave, and the, the practice uh, counts more than the principles, meaning that what you actually do in society um, is is, is more important than, than just adhering to a protocol. Long-term orientation was added after the first four, and what it represents at a short-term orientation point of view is encouraging the um, efforts around uh, education and around thinking and preparing for the future are based on pragmatic approaches, like what can be, what is important right now for the context in which we live in, versus long-term orientation, which prepares for the future by, uh, by engaging in time-honoured traditions. And then a change of, from or divergence from those traditions is viewed with um, constraint or suspicion. Lastly is indulgence versus restraint, which is the, uh, which is the idea that from an indulgence point of view, it's societies that, that are more oriented towards gratification, hedonism, and, um, and enjoying life and having fun as compared to uh, restraint, which is those societies where you suppress gratification of needs and you adhere more to social norms. Maybe you've already been imagining to yourself about where Australia sits in terms of these dimensions. And um, this slide is all about figuring out where we are. But in order to understand where a particular country is, it must be in comparison to another country. So what you'll see here is um, from this website, uh, which gives a whole bunch of insights around different countries, I've extracted the information on the um, cultural dimensions from Hofstede for Australia. And for your, for your knowledge, uh, in order to make sense of what these mean, uh, each of the dimensions are rated from zero to 100, with thing, power distance, for, for instance, lower levels closer to zero mean lower levels of power distance or more egalitarian, whereas higher levels closer to 100 mean higher levels of power distance or, or embedded hierarchies in society. So looking across the board at the, at the dimensions, we can see that Australia has relatively low levels of power distance, high levels of individualism, moderate to mid-range levels of uh, masculinity. And by the way, this, this, uh, this dimension here goes from the most feminine um, or feminine-oriented societies at, the, at zero to the most masculine at 100. In terms of uncertainty avoidance, going on from low to high, uncertainty avoidance, Australia is at absolute in the middle level. Long-term as compared to short-term orientation, this goes from short-term to long-term orientation up here. And what this shows is that Australia has a relatively short-term orientation um, in terms of the cultural dimension. And this uh, indulgence um, to restraint 
goes all the way from restraint at the very bottom to indulgence at the very top. So what this shows us is that Australia also tends to be relatively indulgent in terms of this cultural dimension. Maybe those ratings are what you thought about Australia, maybe they weren't. Um, in terms of putting them into context, what you can do by, by going to this website where I've extracted this information is compare the ratings of one country um, to a few other countries. And I've just chosen um, three countries which are important to me. That is Australia, where I live, New Zealand, where I'm from, and Sri Lanka, where, my, um, where a whole, the other side of my family is from. And what I've done is compare these because in most ways we think that Australia is quite similar to New Zealand, similar types of histories, even though there are some differences, where Sri Lanka is quite different. And we can see that playing out quite, um, uh, quite a lot here. So the blue and purple bars are Australia and New Zealand, and we have similar levels of power distance. Individualism is a bit lower in New Zealand masculinity, uncertainty, avoidance, long-term versus short-term orientation and indulgence. So these things are relatively similar across Australia and New Zealand. There are some differences, but um, in general, when you um, go to operate in a place like New Zealand and you're from Australia, you're likely to understand the culture because there are these similarities in terms of cultural dimensions. Whereas you can see that in Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan values or cult, uh, Sri Lanka on terms of these cultural value dimensions is quite different in a number of ways. Much higher levels of power distance, meaning they're more oriented towards hierarchies. Much lower levels of individualism, meaning that they tend to be more interested in the collective and responsibilities to family, community and society. They tend to be much more oriented towards, um, towards masculinity. That is, they, they tend to have a focus on achievement orientations. They tend to be around about the same in terms of uncertainty avoidance. And this is really interesting to point out because just because some uh, cultural groups are different in some dimensions doesn't mean that they're different in all dimensions. And in terms of um, long-term orientation, they tend to be more uh, long-term orientated oriented more to the long term or tradition and protocol than um, New Zealand and Australia are. And unfortunately, there is no data in terms of indulgence, and that's because it's the most recent, uh, it's the most recent dimension to come about. I would strongly suggest that if you're interested in looking at these dimensions across cultures, that you could do go ahead and have a have a look at that website that's posted there. Why cultural dimensions important? They're important because they represent values, and those are those deeply held ideas about the world and how we should live that um, influence our behaviour. But values in and of themselves exist at multiple levels. They exist at the collective level, which is what we are, we're talking about when we talk about national level values. There's this widely shared abstract ideas about what's good and right, um, about what's acceptable and not acceptable. And what they do is they frame the goals of members within the collective. So we can say that, that the cultural dimensions that we looked at just before say something about Australian society broadly, but not necessarily about all individuals living in society. So uh, at the individual level, our personal values are distinct from the collective level values, um, but they're shaped by them. They represent the cognitive representations of the goals and behaviours that we have as individuals. Their personal values that transcend situations and that serve as guiding principles in our own lives. Um, so just because national values exist within the society that you may live in doesn't mean you personally adhere to those values um, in the same way that average levels of values play out in the nation in which you live. Personal values and cultural values or, or collective and individual values are going to become more important as we discuss the next value framework, which is called Schwartz's National Values. Schwartz's National Values are, are measured and operationalized at both the cultural level or the national level, as well as at the individual level. And we're going to be discussing what each one of those means because they're slightly different. Schwartz said that there are three major problems that society faces, and those three problems can be um, can be operationalized and understood in terms of the dimensions of values, of national values. The first dimension is embeddedness versus autonomy. And what this dimension represents is this problem 
of defining the boundaries between the person and the group that they belong to and the optimal relations between them. In society's high and embeddedness, there is a high value placed on preserving the status quo within the society that you live in, and you, uh, individuals avoid actions that undermine the order, the social order. These uh, important values in such societies are respect for tradition, security, obedience, and wisdom. Whereas in societies that are more autonomous, individuals themselves are viewed as personal agents. In these societies, individuals cultivate and express their own opinions and ideas and feelings. Such autonomy or preferences towards autonomy can be broken down into two specific areas. That is intellectual autonomy, which refers to the independent pursuit of ideas and, um, and intellect and human rights, whereas effective autonomy refers to the pursuit of um, effectively positive experience, such as um, a varied life's pleasure and enjoyment in life. The second problem facing societies is understood through the dimension of um, hierarchy versus egalitarianism. And the problem that Swart suggested uh, that, this, that this dimension relates to is ensuring coordination among people to produce goods and services in a way that it preserve the social fabric. Hierarchy places an emphasis on legitimate um, roles and fixed resources. And the key elements of this are social power, authority, humility, and wealth. Whereas egalitarian is typical in societies that, in which there is concern for the well-being of others, such as ideas of equality, social justice, responsibility, and help. The third problem faced by society is um, outlined by the uh, by the dimension of mastery versus harmony, and uh, the problem of within those societies is regulating the utilization of human and natural resources. To what extent should individuals and groups control or change the social and national environment, um, leaving it undisturbed or unchanged? Harmony, as per the label, um, emphasises a harmonious fit with nature and as well as the environment, protection of the environment, and um, whereas mastery is a priority of the dominance of, uh, of individuals and groups on the surroundings and is emphasized by things like ambition, success, and, um, and risk-taking. And the figure um, here representing Schwartz's value, values um, shows us how they relate to one another. And that is uh, in a so complex model where egalitarian, where values around egalitarianism tend to be um, opposite values that are that concern um, mastery or hierarchy, where values that concern things like embeddedness tend to be opposite to values that concern intellectual autonomy and effective autonomy. And within that model, there's a variety of words that, that um, describe what each of those values mean. And looking at how these values cluster together and what's most important at a national level, what Schwartz did was um, was compare a whole variety of countries using this thing called multidimensional scaling, which puts specific cult cultural or country groups in specific spaces around that circumplex model. And what you can see here by looking at um, the different patterns or on what um, some countries are more um, oriented towards than others is uh, there are some groupings, historical groupings of societies in and around one another. So you might be looking for Australia right now. I'm going to quickly point that out to you right here, which is um, oriented towards the uh, autonomy and mastery part of the model alongside other um, what we call settler nations like New Zealand um, or with sharing similar um, histories to Britain, the UK, Canada. Um, whereas other countries, uh, are, like at the opposite end of the spectrum, countries that are coloured blue here are countries in Africa, and we can see that um, Egypt has a, a type of pattern that is much more oriented towards embeddedness. Whereas at this side, um, with European countries in white, we see orientations that are much more oriented towards egalitarianism, and then also um, getting closer towards intellectual autonomy. Not only can you use Schwartz's um, national value framework to look at how countries are positioned uh, um, next to one another in terms of the circumplex model, another thing that you can do is look at the ratings of different countries 
on each of the dimensions. And what this figure does is show us the ratings on each of the dimensions of four countries that are quite distinct from one another. The USA, which is, um, which is in the dotted line, the dotted blue line here. Germany, which is in the solid blue line. Um, Egypt, which is in the other slightly different solid blue line. And China, which is in the, the dash and dot dot line. If you look at any one of these, you can see that in general, there tend to be those those profiles of values where when there is emphasis on one side um, of, the, of the circle or the circumflex model, there tends to be less emphasis on the other side. So here we can see in Germany that there is a strong emphasis towards egalitarianism, intellectual autonomy and harmony, which all at that side of the circle, and there is less of an emphasis on embeddedness, hierarchy, and a little bit more on mastery. So what you get is a profile that is predominantly high in a few areas around here and low in the others. Whereas you can see different sorts of, um, of patterns by looking at, the, like say, the um, orientation of China, where there's a high level of mastery, um, a highish or much higher than the others, level of hierarchy and embeddedness. And in this way, we can make comparisons, not just across cultures in terms of how things look as the as the, val the confluence of the values, but also the patterns of those values within specific cultures. However, it's important to understand that cultural values and dimensions of cultural values are best understood as syndromes, just like we saw in the way that um, Schwartz has put together those three dimensions, they work together, they're not separate from one another. And so if we consider these to be cultural syndromes, then we don't think about a culture as just or a nation just being individualistic. We think about it being individualistic and what else? And, um, and that's what a cultural syndrome means, the interrelated interrelationship between the uh, dimensions that reflect different aspects of the social context. So let's have a look at two distinct um, cultural syndromes that have emerged in, uh, in, uh, in the data and analysis that's been done around cultural dimensions. The first cultural syndrome that we find is around cultural complexity, which refers to cultures that uh, cultural complexity's dimension, which is distinct from the others that we've just learned about, refers to, to cultures that are simple, so it's something like hunter, gatherers, or complex, something like information societies. Whereas a different dimension called tightness versus looseness refers to cultures that have rules and norms and ideas about what is correct behavior versus those who have fewer norms. And you can see that um, tightness, looseness looks like some of the other things that we've seen in Hofstetter as well, but it's been treated a little bit differently. What we find when we're putting these things together is individualism as a, as a cultural value predominates in societies that are complex and loose, whereas collectivism predominates in societies and simple and tight. So that's something about the interrelationship between these cultural dimensions, not just treating them separately. And we have a, a secondary syndrome, which is around hierarchy and um, activity. So hierarchy, which you've seen already, um, Hofstede defined as power distance, and here has been also defined as vertical as compared to horizontal, which is kind of vertical as role oriented. And what it means is like there's many distinct layers between people versus horizontal like this, everyone's egalitarian. Um, and active and passive cultures are those that are differentiated by the degree in which individuals try to engage in the environment to fit them versus those that don't, which is very much similar to the harmony and mastery um, proposed by Schwartz. What has been found is that individualism, ten individualism tends to predominate in societies that are horizontal and active, whereas collectivism predominates in societies that are vertical and passive. And you can see from these two um, outlines of syndromes that have been found in the research, Cultural dimensions are not all separate from one another, they are interrelated. But let's get back to the distinction between collective and personal values, because this is a really important issue that has been pointed out in cross-cultural psychology that is called ecological fallacy. The ecological fallacy says that variation in values between individuals within a society is much greater than variation between national samples. So what that means is people tend to vary a lot more within the group, then cultures do vary amongst themselves. The dimension scores, um, regardless of 
whether it's Schwartz that you're talking about, Hofstede or any of the other variety of value dimensions, can, they can give us approximations of cultural context, but they don't enable predictions about the behaviours of individuals. So what that means is you can say that somebody comes from or um, their ancestry originates from a, uh, a an X type of society, a high uncertainty avoidance, high collectivist society, but you can't necessarily say that about the individual and then predict their behaviour from that. Societal culture is a latent hypothetical construct, it cannot be observed directly, but can be inferred from its manifestations. The rich, complex, uh, complex of meanings, beliefs, practices, symbols, norms and values prevalent among people in a society, among the manifestations of the underlying culture, they are not culture itself. And so what this means is that we can't take uh, these cultural dimensions to represent um, each and every individual, but rather we can use them as heuristic, heuristics to understand how different cultural values may play out in different, um, in different environments. The ecological fallacy would, would is uh, the fallacy that we assume that relationships or things that happen at one level of analysis are the same at a different level of analysis. And why that's important here is because the, if we are prone to the ecological fallacy, we would say that because you come from an individualistic culture, you are individualistic. Because you come from a, a masculine culture, you adhere to those values. And then um, that would not actually be understanding what the cultural values um, dimensions measure and what they're supposed to represent. Schwartz kind of overcame this um, by both examining culture at the national level as well as culture at the personal value level. And what you can see from this model here is the personal value model is that a lot of the, the um, theorizing that he did about national cultures can also apply to individuals, but there's a little bit more nuance in this. And there's a little, there's some distinctions in the dimensions that we're interested in here. So one of the key, di there are really only two key dimensions. The first one is openness to change as compared to conservation, and the second is self-enhancement as compared to self-transcendence. And within these dimensions, there's a variety of things that you may or may not value. But just like Schwartz's circumplex model of national cultures, if you value things at one side of the circle, you're less likely to value things at the other side. So if you value um, stimulation, if things like you value being daring, having variation in life, being excite, excitement, um, you're more likely to value things in and around that, like um, being self-indulgent or being or things being pleasurable, having self-respect. And you're less likely to endorse values at the other side of it, which are things like respecting tradition, and being devout, honouring your elders, being obedient. So what this distinction between national and personal values can tell us is that you can map one onto the other, but there are nuances and distinctions when it comes to personal level values and national values. And just because you live in a society where some things are valued more than others doesn't mean that you have the same value profile at a personal level. You may be wondering right now, what are my personal values and how do they map onto this? You can go and check that out by filling in this survey right here, which is research that's specifically being done in Australia on personal values of Australians. And from this research, it's been found that there are some values that predominate at the personal level as well. Um, so these don't represent uh, national values. These represent a whole bunch of individuals and what we consider to be important for ourselves. So coming out at the very top is the idea of benevolence. And then following that is security and universalism at both the social and natural level, as well as hedonism. I strongly suggest you go and fill this out and have a, have a think about your values in relationship, your personal values in relationship to the values that we see happening at the national level that influence a whole bunch of things as, um, as they're considered to be normal or acceptable within our society.